Okay, time for some R6RS, most boring videos ever made. We are on page seven. Let's see if we can do a whole page in one sitting. It took us two videos to get to the last page. All right, 1.5 forums. So remember, we're, we're talking about the overview of the language. We just finished expressions and then statements. Let's talk about forms. 1.5 forms. While definitions are not expressions, and we saw that last time in 1.4, compound expressions and definitions exhibit similar syntactic structure. Okay. Zoom in a little. Oh, I'm starting to get used to this keyboard. <clears throat> All right, so we can see left paren define x 23 right paren. And then left paren asterisk x2. Okay. While the first line contains a definition and the second an expression, this distinction depends on the bindings for define and times, or asterisk, or what a star, what do you want to call it? At the purely syntactical level, both are forms, and form is the general name for a syntactic part of a scheme program. In particular, 23 is a subform of the form left paren define x 23 right paren. Cool. Yeah. All right. So we have a new technical term, which is form. So definitions and compound expressions are both forms. Uh, in fact, expressions in general sounds like are forms. So definitions and expressions are both forms. So scheme, I guess, is about form-based programming. I mean, it's really expression-based mostly, but you could, I guess, be more general and say it's form-based. Procedures. Definitions can also be used to define procedures. Define fx to be plus x42 and then f applied to 23. <clears throat> if we apply f to 23, that evaluates, that expression evaluates to the value 65. All right, let's try it. I'll try typing it in. See if my typing has improved. All right, let's, tr let's do it. Oh yeah, wait, why don't I have an extra print? Did I delete something? Uh, somehow something went wrong. All right, I was very proud of myself for a moment. Let's hack it. Huh? Uh-oh. All right, let's hack it again. <laughs> Pretend you didn't see that. Okay, it's all better now. Yay. Cool, 65, that's what we expected. All right, I'm getting better with my keyboard. 
still have some work to do, as you can tell. All right, so it works as expected in Shea. Uh, okay. In some sense, I so far don't like this description. I don't like part of the description. Okay, it gets into something important later. So I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but it's true, this is a syntax for a definition. You can define a procedure. Okay, notice the word procedure, not function, procedure. Scheme has procedures and procedures are allowed to have effects they can do mutation input output so forth they're not mathematical functions necessarily they can be used to model mathematical functions often we program in a functional style in scheme but these are procedures and scheme is about representing procedural knowledge to a large extent there's an all a long symbolic ai approach using procedural knowledge a procedure is slightly simplified an abstraction of an expression over objects, okay, it's an abstraction. So here we have an abstraction of an expression where we're adding 42 to some other number, uh, but we want to abstract which number we're adding to 42. In the example, the first definition defines a procedure called f. Note the parentheses around fx, which indicate that this is a procedure definition. Yeah, that's sometimes called the MIT syntax, this type of definition. The expression f uh, applied to 23, left paren f, 23 right, that expression is a procedure call, meaning roughly evaluate plus x 42, the body of the procedure, with x bound to 23. Okay, roughly, that's what it means. And of course, when you really know the rules, it could be more complicated because, well, of various complications. And in fact, to a large extent, the book SICP, Structure, Interp Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs, talks about this process in various levels of detail. Okay, evaluates the body. So this is the body of the procedure that we're defining. It's the body expression of the definition. And this will get evaluated when the procedure is called with x bound to 23. That's one way to think about it. Okay, it can be more complicated in practice, but that's roughly how to think about it. As procedures are objects, they can be passed to other procedures. Okay, so define f of x plus x 42. Okay, we already defined that. Define g p x to be p applied to x, and then we can call g with f and 23. Okay, let's define that one as well. All right, even though I'm slow with my kinesis with Dvorak, I seem to rage less when <laughs> I'm having trouble typing. I also find it, I have a better mental model already of where my fingers are in relation to the keys, so I think I'll get faster, but it's just less aggravating. I don't know, much less finger movement. No, I like it. Okay, so the idea is that G is a procedure that takes a procedure as its first argument and then takes some, some other value X and applies P to X. 
So we have a procedure that takes a procedure and something else, like in this case, since f expects a number, g could take f in 23, and then it's going to apply f to 23. All right, no problem. So we can have a procedure that takes a procedure as an argument. Okay, because procedures are objects. In this example, the body of g is evaluated with p bound to f and x bound to 23, which is equivalent to f, the, the procedure call f uh, applied to 23, which evaluates the 65, which is what we got, great. In fact, many predefined operations of scheme are provided not by syntax, but by variables whose values are procedures. The plus operation, for example, which receives special syntactic treatment in many other languages, is just a regular identifier in scheme bound to a procedure that adds number objects. The same holds for asterisks and many others. Okay, so let's check it out. Yeah. Let's try. Great. That blew my mind when I first saw this. I thought everything had to be like Java or C, uh, where there's special syntax around addition. Now I can't stand that when I see that. I was like, really? Why? Why do you have to design your language that way? Anyway, it can't all be as cool as Scheme, I guess. All right. Uh, Cutting edge 70s technology hasn't caught up to the rest of uh, programming languages. You know, really 50s technology, really 1930s technology, let's be real. Okay, um, yeah, it takes about 100 years for ideas to catch on, so maybe, you know, who knows, maybe the 2030s will be the year in which uh, Java discovers S expressions. You know, we, one can hope. Define each op x, y. I'm going to apply op to x and y. Okay, so h is going to be a procedure that takes a binary operator or an operator that can take two uh, functions. To, I mean, take two arguments or objects. It doesn't have to be uh, only binary. And then apply op to x and y. Great. That looks... Uh, straightforward. It looks like the same sort of idea, so let's just try it. Right. I think I'm getting faster. Where's each? Ah, it's right under my left index finger. By the way, control J uh, does a new line in the REPL. Very handy command. And control L in Emacs will uh, center vertically. Very handy. Okay, that works. Nine six six, that works as well. All right, very cool. Same idea. 
Procedure definitions are not the only way to create procedures. Okay, this is the part I was waiting for. A Lambda expression creates a new procedure as an object with no need to specify a name. Sometimes it's called an anonymous procedure. Sometimes people call it an anonymous Lambda, but Lambdas are anonymous um, in general. So I would say the procedure object itself doesn't have a name, not the Lambda. Anyway, anonymous procedure. A Lambda expression creates a new procedure as an object with no need to specify a name. Okay, so here we have Lambda X. Okay, so this syntax drives some people up the wall, okay? It is very important if you're new to Scheme or new to Lisp that you get used to paying very close attention to all the parens. Like I said before, every parenthesis in Scheme means something. You can't remove or add parentheses in Scheme without changing the meaning. So this expression is a Lambda expression. Its value will be a procedure of one argument. The overall expression is not a Lambda expression. The overall expression is an application or procedure call. That is a procedure call, okay, whose first sub-expression or sub-form, if we want to talk about forms and sub-form. So the overall form is a procedure call, and the first sub-form is a lambda expression, which will evaluate to a procedure. So what this really means is we're going to end up with a lambda expression that evaluates the procedure, and then that procedure gets called immediately with 23. And 23, you can think of as being bound to X, and then we'll add 23 to 42. That's sort of our naive model of evaluation right now. Okay, but the important part is that overall form is not a Lambda expression. If you ask beginning scheme programmers or list programmers, what type of expression is that? Often they'll say, this is a Lambda expression. That is not right. This is a left, left Lambda. In fact, Dan Friedman will use the term left, left lambda to mean a direct application. Turns out this is equivalent to a let binding in, uh, in a very real way. Uh, we'll find out later. Uh, but that is not, that overall form is not a lambda expression. Okay, so you have to pay attention to all of those parentheses. Left, left lambda is a standard idiom in scheme. That is different from left run lambda. Very, very important that you can recognize these um, visually. It's also important you have tool support with your editor and so forth. I mean, if you're, if you really know Scheme inside and out, you don't have to. I've seen plenty of people who don't have fancy print matching or syntax highlighting. However, if you're just learning Lisp, I highly recommend at a minimum you have the print matching where, you know, if you type a, a paren, the other one gets highlighted, or if you mouse over a paren or have your point an Emacs over a paren, the other one flashes, that kind of thing. Um, you really want to make sure that you can tell when the parens are balanced, you know where the parens go. Uh, it's really critical. That's like a core competency for a scheme programmer. After a while, it becomes second nature. I remember when, when I was teaching um, scheme classes at Indiana I would write some big scheme expression on the board with lots of left, left lambdas and lets and all that. And then, you know, after I filled up the board, a student would say, oh, you left a paren out. And I'd say, no, I didn't. <laughs> and then I'd go back and we'd look at all. And I never made a mistake. And the, the reason I never mis made a mistake is I would actually use my fingers to match the parens as I was writing on the board. I think the students didn't notice I was doing that probably, but you know, I know I never made a paren mistake when I was writing on the board because I had built in paren matching using, you know, the physical process of my left finger being on the open and my right finger being on the close. And I could write all day on the board and never make a paren mistake. Well, you want to have the same setup with your editor. Now I say that, having made a paren mistake already in this video. Um, but I, I noticed I didn't hit return. I could tell immediately visually I made a paren mistake because I'm still getting used to this keyboard and I knew how to fix it. 
awkwardly um, because everything's awkward right now. But, you know, the, the point is it will come over time. It's worth really investing in that pattern matching so and tool support so that you just don't make those mistakes. Anyway, that's my little rant. Because <clears throat> um, this, this, you know, really trips people up. And this is what people say when they say, oh, the parentheses are driving me up the wall. It's like, well, the parentheses actually are awesome. But there is, you have to get over this part, which happens. You eventually will get over that and you'll love the print. The entire expression in this example is a procedure call. <clears throat> Lambda X plus X uh, 42 evaluates to a procedure that takes a single number object and adds 42 to it. What's the value of a Lambda expression? Procedure. Okay. It's very important. So this is also something I'd ask my students and say, All right, there's got to be a B key or somewhere. B, where's B? That'd be sad if I didn't have a B key and I couldn't type lambda. Uh, oh, okay. So I would do things like write this expression on the board and I'd ask my students, what is the value of this expression? <clears throat> and many of them would say seven. The value of the expression is seven. And that is not right. The value of the expression is procedure. Now that procedure is one which Let's see if I can navigate this. Control E. Okay. So if I have the procedure call to that procedure, then the resulting procedure that you get from lambda x plus 3, 4 from that evaluation is going to ignore the argument passed in that object 42 and then evaluate plus 3, 4 to return 7. Okay, sure. So when we call that procedure with the proper number of arguments, we'll get back 7. But... Notice the lambda expression itself has the value of a procedure. A lambda expression always evaluates to a procedure. It never evaluates to the value of the body of the lambda. The body of the lambda is only evaluated when the resulting procedure is called. Very important. In fact, that's one of the main uses of lambda is to delay evaluation of the body. That's a very common technique used in scheme programming is to delay evaluation. So important that you really have those things down. Very, very important. Have to know that inside and out. Okay. Uh, so the entire expression is procedure call. Lambda X plus X uh, 42 evaluates a procedure that takes a single number object and adds 42 to it. Great. I think we understand all that. Oh, yeah. The other thing I was going to say is... <clears throat> You know, we, we've got this define syntax up here, right? The, what, what I call the MIT syntax. Uh, that's not how Dan Friedman would write it. Dan would write it this way.
Okay, so that turns out to be equivalent. Um, so this so-called MIT syntax, you know, you can think of that as equivalent, but sort of syntactic sugar or shorthand for this other thing, just because you define procedures so often in Scheme. Um, Dan prefers to show this way when teaching students because he wants the lambda to be obvious. And in some sense, this is arguably an, uh, a friendlier way for people beginning to, to learn Scheme because it makes it very clear that really, you know, there's nothing special going on here. The purpose of define, as Aziz likes to say, is to give a name to a value. So we're just doing a standard define thing of giving a name, h, to the value of the procedure. Okay, and then the lambda expressions generate procedures, and procedures just objects just like numbers are objects and booleans are objects. So if you think of it that way, there's nothing really special going on. Now, where it can get a little special in general with define is if the expression on the right-hand side of define refers to the name that you're defining. Like if we had a reference to H inside of that Lambda expression, like in the body. Uh, but that's not really special Lambda. I mean, any expression in scheme could refer to the H. Um, so, you know, that that is true that when you start having... Um, these sorts of recursive references or self-reference, uh, that type of thing. It can, you know, things can get a little more complicated, but that's not really a Lambda thing so much. That's just self-reference thing. Um, so anyway, there's nothing really special about what's going on here. So that's, Dan likes to show that the time where you wouldn't, sh he, you know, you wouldn't see that in one of Dan's classes is maybe if, if you're trying to see what where the higher order functions are, like procedures that return procedures, well, then the MIT syntax is kind of nice because only if you have a procedure that's returning a procedure as an argument, or if you have an argument expression that's creating an anonymous procedure, would you see lambdas. So you don't see any lambdas in this code, so it's telling you it's not, um, you're not actually returning a new procedure from within define. Of course, H real, I mean, within H, H is higher order and that is taking a procedure op, but we're not creating a new procedure um, inside of the body of H. And if you look at uh, defrel for define relation in mini Canron in the second edition of Reason Schema, for example, you'll see a similar sort of thing where with defrel, when you're defining a relation, you're not seeing any lambdas. All the lambdas are hidden that's on purpose because mini Canron only supports first order syntactic unification, doesn't support unification over Lambda. So mini Canron's really a first order language, not a higher order language. Um, so you can do things like hide the Lambda with syntax uh, in this style. Okay, so it depends what you wanna emphasize, but just be aware that these are equivalent in scheme. All right. 1.7, procedure calls and syntactic keywords. Whereas plus 2342, F23, and lambda x plus, oh, well, look at that line break. This drives me up the wall. Lambda x plus x42 uh, applied to 23 are all examples of procedure calls. Lambda and let expressions are not. This is because lambda, I was actually let, even though it is an identifier, is not a variable, but is instead a syntactic keyword. A form that has a syntactic keyword as its first sub-expression, a base, special rules determined by the keyword. The define identifier in a definition is also a syntactic keyword. Hence, definitions are also not procedure calls. All right, well, I'm not sure I love the wording of this, but let's just talk about what this means. Well, first of all, let's just you know verify, trust but verify. We're gonna trust. We're gonna try all these things out. Okay, so let's see. We got okay procedure call. 
Okay, f of 23. Great. And then we have this lambda monstrosity that doesn't really fit. Ugh. That page break is, I mean, that line break is really driving me up a wall. All right. After you've written books and these dissertations and stuff like that, you know, I don't know, like little little things like line breaks in the middle of a lambda body really upset you, if you're like me at least. I mean, I understand why it happens also, but it doesn't bother me less. All right, so that's the expression. So we have a direct application of a procedure. All right, Work, works uh, as advertised. Are all examples of procedure calls. Lambda and let expressions are not. So I guess that means lambda expressions and let expressions are not procedure calls. Okay, this is because let even though it is an identifier, is not a variable, but instead a syntactic keyword. Okay, so I think we've talked about this before, but if I type, if I type let or if I type lambda, notice we get an exception. This is different than if I typed a name that's not bound at all. Okay, so notice the difference in error message or exception message. So it's important to pay attention to these things. If I type in foo, I get an exception. The variable foo is not bound. But if I type in lambda or let, the exception I get is different. So for lambda, I get the exception invalid syntax lambda. So it means lambda is actually defined, but it means that lambda is syntax. So first of all, it tells you it's syntax. And secondly, it means I'm not using the syntax correctly. There is something called identifier syntax where you can just have, you know, the one syntactic keyword and that's the whole thing. That's the entire syntax, but that's not the case for let, lambda or let, you know, so lambda expects syntax that looks more like this nested thing here, right? So, uh, yeah, so those are uh, let and lambda are not uh, procedure calls, uh, uses of let and lambda are not procedure calls. Those are, those are, um, special forms are often called. Okay. So a form has, that has a syntactic keyword as its first sub expression obeys special rules determined by the keyword and defined as the same thing. So basically it's saying that if we go back to let, let's see. I mean, the lambda. Okay, so here's our lambda expression. And the, we have an expression, and it looks like a procedure application in a way, right? So it looks syntactically, it looks very similar to this f applied to 23. You have a left paren, and then you have some, some name and then you have some more stuff. Um, so even though syntactically, you know, superficially, a Lambda expression looks like a procedure application, it's not. And the reason is 
that first thing coming after a left parenthesis is a keyword. Okay, so lambda is a special keyword. Now, I could change this lambda, so I could say, well, let's not do lambda, let's do lambda, like that, whatever, however you pronounce that. And notice the error message that I get. Exception, variable x is not bound. What happened? Well, a scheme is treating this overall expression as a procedure call now because LAMBD is not a keyword. Okay, in fact, it's not even bound at all. So the rule in the scheme is if there's a left paren and the thing coming immediately after the left paren is not um, a keyword, then the entire parenthesized expression is treated as a procedure call. And the rules are going to be that the sub expressions in some unspecified order will be evaluated. Notice the error didn't have to do with lambda not being defined. It had to do with X not being bound. So there are two expressions, two sub expressions with X in them. There's this one here and there's this other one here. One of those is being evaluated. Um, we can we can actually test this out a little bit more. Let's change the name here. Okay, variable X is not bound. So it's telling us that it's actually this um, second sub expression or sub form is what's being evaluated first. And in fact, because X is not a, a keyword, these parens around X, that's being also treated as a procedure call. And so the X is being evaluated as part of that. Um, and X is not bound, so you get an exception. Um, so this is just trying to show you that if you change lambda to something else, and so it's no longer a keyword, um, you know, you you can really see that the evaluation rules are different because now we're in procedure call evaluation rules. All right, so we're back in our ha happy uh, lambda lambda. Let's, let's try one more game. All right, so that works, right? Because we're using the regular evaluation rules of Lambda. Well, let's, let's change something. Okay, so we can redefine lambda to be whatever we want. We're gonna redefine it to be the constant 42. Before, when we typed in lambda, we got an exception <clears throat> because we, we, you know, we, were, we had the incorrect syntax for lambda. <clears throat> now we get 42. Now, if I try evaluating the lambda expression, what happens? Variable x is not bound, okay? Because 
just like when we typed L-A-M-B-D instead of Lambda, you can see that we've got, um, you know, we're no longer treating Lambda as a special form with special evaluation rules. So same sort of thing has happened as before um, with L-A-M-B-D. There you go. So I think I got a package here, by the way. I think I got my fancy... Um, Apple trackpad to try to put between my split keyboard on risers to see if that voice having to use the um, uh, laptop trackpad whenever I want something. All right. Uh, let's just finish this paragraph off. Uh, the rules for the Lambda keyword specify that the first subform is a list of parameters and the remaining subforms are the body of the procedure. In let expressions, the first subform is a list of binding specifications, and the remaining subforms consti constitute a body of expressions. Okay, and we'll, we'll encounter those more formally, but we've already seen let and lambda, so we know what they mean. So the, the whole point is, instead of those parens inside of a let or a lambda referring to procedure applications, um, they can mean binding structure, or they can, you know, uh, they can represent here's the body of one of these expressions, which follows the normal evaluation rules once the procedure is called, but actually they're modified because you have to talk about environments and so forth. Um, anyway, as soon as you can define syntax or special forms in, in a language like Scheme, you can change how the semantics work, the evaluation uh, semantics work, and it's different from procedure calls. Procedure calls can generally be distinguished from these special forms by looking for a syntactic keyword in the first position of a form. If the first position does not contain a syntactic keyword, the expression is a procedure call. Okay, and that's what we were talking about. So-called identifier macros allow creating other kinds of special forms but are comparatively rare. That's true. There aren't I rarely run into identifier macros. Those are the, the macros where just the keyword by itself stands for the entire macro. The set of syntactic keywords of scheme is fairly small, which usually makes this task fairly simple. It is possible, however, to create new bindings for syntactic keywords, see section 1.9 below. Of course, we have the whole macro uh, aspect of scheme. And assignments are carrying over to the next section. So I will leave that for next time. So we basically finished all of, of page seven. Um, all right, great. Moving on, uh, next next time we'll do section 1.8 and 1.9 and maybe 1.10 and maybe get into continuations. Wow. All right, moving right along. Uh, hope you're doing well. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.